we're back. I hope you had a good break. And I think it's time to kind of look at another dimension of communication. We talked about getting to know ourselves, getting to know each other. We talked a little bit about the more you share with me what's convenient for me to learn and I share with you what's convenient to, for you to learn about ourselves, the more we get to understand each other. And, and, and it's critical. It's important because that opens my mind and my heart to be able to work with people. It helps us be able to communicate better. It helps us build a better relationship. When I see that you give me advice for my good and I give you advice for your good, sometimes we give each other advice for our own good. I want you to change for my benefit. You want me to change for your benefit. And that's very important that I change for your benefit, but it has to come from my heart. And that's where the word love comes into play. So when I listen to you, give me feedback, or you listen to me, when I give you feedback, we build and grow on a better relationship with one another. And that's important. That's what we are all about. Now, I, I wanna just close and kind of transition from uh, the giving and receiving feedback into the next topic. Just giving you seven effective feedback criteria, if you will. Um, the feedback provider is credible in the eyes of the person who receives the feedback, which is a little bit of what I just said. If I believe in you, and I believe in your intention, and I believe in your capacity, and I believe in your judgment, I will listen to you. And it goes both ways. I have to make myself be believable. So the credibility of the giving of the giver and the receiver of the feedback is important. <laughs> Sometimes I choose not to give feedback to somebody because in my mind, in my heart, in my relationship, I don't think they're gonna listen and I don't think it's gonna be helpful. We have to move away from that too. We have to develop that relationship that could be hampered by something could be hampered by resentment and we have to be able to be open to that. The other um, uh, criteria is the feedback provider is trusted by the feedback recipient. It's not just credibility, it's trust. It's, it's confidence, it's uh, I thank you. Then the third criteria is that feedback is conveyed with good intentions. I'm giving you feedback for your sake. I'm getting feedback so that you can grow. I'm giving feedback so you can be a better person. And that's important. That's very, very, very important. The timing and the circumstances of giving and receiving feedback need to be appropriate. I'm not going to give you feedback in a moment of anger. And yes, good friends, brothers and sisters who love each other, get angry at each other. Let's wait for the appropriate moment. In the moment of anger, in the moment of frustration, you might say the wrong thing. You might mix up the words out of emotion. And there's always the perception that what comes out of my, your mind, is out of your mouth, is already in your mind. So be careful what the circumstances in which you give feedback to somebody are. Make sure the feedback is gonna be given with serenity, with compassion, with love, with generosity. I give you feedback not because I feel sorry for you, not because I'm angry at you. 
I give you feedback because I love you. And it has to be in the context of love. Feedback is given in an interactive manner. We have to be able to talk. What exactly do you mean by that? I really don't understand. And I can't feel that that response is defensive. I, 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 we have to be legitimate in the way we ask for feedback about the feedback. What did I do? What made you feel? What makes you feel that I do that, that I behave that way? Give me a good example. I don't get it. And when you say, I don't get it, you're honest. So, so we have a dialogue when we give feedback. We have to be ready for that conversation. The other one is the feedback message needs to be clear. You have to have a good basis to say, I see you doing this. When you do this, I feel this way. And it's not just one time, you do it often. The other person needs to have the confidence, the trust, and the relationship to listen, to take it in and not to react defensively, but to ask and make sure you understand what exactly do you mean. And the feedback has to be helpful for the person who receives the feedback. It can be, I'm gonna give you feedback and I don't care what you do with it, no, no, no. It needs to be helpful. I'm giving you feedback so you become a better person, period. That's what feedback is all about. Now, this, I, I think, leads us to the next topic, which is conflict. And conflict will happen when there's two people working together, living together. It could be a couple married who have lived together for 15, 20 years, 30, 40. There will be conflict because people think differently. People, the, the, pe people process information differently because people have different expectations. There is and needs and, 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 and it needs to be addressed. There will be conflict, it's just natural. What do we do with it? And I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples in scripture. Um, in, in, in the book of Matthew chapter 20, 2028, 20, I'm not gonna read it, but you'll remember that the mother of the sons of Zebedee went to Jesus asking that one sit on the right and the other sits on the left of Jesus when he's in his kingdom. I mean, there's 10 more apostles. How would they feel if they knew that that was being addressed? Actually, how did they feel when they found out that was being addressed? They got upset. What makes them the champion of the world? What makes them better than all of us? Why are they going to sit on the right and left? How about me? And this type of reaction happens because we are not completely mature in our faith. For a faithful person, a person who is very close to God, being on the right or on the left side of Jesus is nice, but it's not a criteria about my salvation. My salvation is based on how I respond to the call of Jesus. Now, we had 12 apostles with Jesus hanging out here and there, but even when he ascended into heaven after his resurrection, after they saw him a few times, after his resurrection, he still summoned them before he ascended into heaven. And if you read chapter 28 of the book of Matthew, you'll find that some of them in that moment still entertain doubt. Now, the Holy Spirit, 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, descended upon them. Then, they were able to really live according to God's will. Jesus summoned them and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentile lords, it is over them and the great ones to make their authority over them be felt. So basically the world leaders will make sure that people know that I'm the boss, that the president is the boss, 
Let the director is the boss. Okay. But it shall not be so amongst you. Rather, whoever wishes to be great amongst you shall be your servant. So whether we sit on the right or on the left means nothing. What really means is how do I serve the needy? How do I serve as a son of God? How do I serve in obedience to the teachings of Christ? Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. It goes even deeper, especially in that time, will be your slave. So the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. And that's exactly what the Son of Man did. That's exactly what the Son of Man did. The Son of Man loved and in love, the Son of Man served, served you and served me. All too often, we let this director, this clergy, this um, president, this king go to our head the wrong way. That's why when we're anointed in baptism, we're anointed as Jesus was baptized, priest, prophet, and king. And the king is the greatest server of the kingdom. The king makes sure that everybody has what they need to live a fruitful, faithful, and loving life. And that includes, has the needs to feed themselves, their family, house themselves, be able to go one place or the other, and more importantly, be able to serve one another. Now, again, as we go into the conflict mode that we're going to be talking about, I also want to make sure that we look at the correction. How do we correct one another? And again, Matthew gives us a good hint. If your brother uh, sins against you, call him. Call him apart. Tell them what's going on. Tell them how you feel. Give them feedback. Let them know the damage it's doing. And then, if the person continues with that inappropriate behavior, call somebody who can testify, who can support, who can actually help that person who's misbehaving change in their behavior. And again, we're seeking an attitude of love by loving in this correcting process. By loving the person we're correcting. So both, or maybe three, let the person know the area of growth that that person needs to have. And we read this in the book of Revelations in the, the uh, feedback topic. So we're giving this friend some feedback. And then if the person does not change, you report him to the community. You ask the community. And maybe somebody in the community might be able to pull that person apart and give them feedback. If he doesn't change then, he really doesn't want to be part of us. So let us examine ourselves in our everyday life, how do we behave? How do we counterclaim? What is our defects? And how do we address them? And we have to clean ourselves before we go clean somebody else. Remember, we can't look at the little um, piece of whatever in your eye, in somebody else's eye, if you don't look at the stake that's in yours. So let's make sure that we go to the Eucharist worthily and receive it. And when we say that amen, we're not just saying amen to receiving the communion as the body of Christ. 
we're saying amen as a response that that communion will transform me. And that's what we're looking for, to be transformed. So let us go now to talk a little bit about conflict and how conflict happens. So this topic is interpersonal relationships dealing with conflict. And I'm going to address five conflict styles, just an example so that we can become aware that we have multiple opportunities uh, and, and particular needs in our management of conflict. <clears throat> I just want to point out that there is um, two spectrums. One, if we look at the table we're seeing, we look upward, we're seeing the importance of assertiveness, which is focusing on my needs, my desired outcome my agenda. So going completely assertive and focusing on me might not be a good thing, but sometimes it's necessary. When we go on the vertical spectrum, we see cooperativeness. We see the focus on others, the need for mutual relationships so that we can really address the conflict in a way that's it's effective for all, not just for me. For example, if we look at the top um, left side, when we talk about conflict styles, we're seeing competitiveness. So we compete. Why? Because we want our outcome. Now, I might be completely convinced that the outcome I'm seeking is the best possible outcome for the community I'm living with. And I might have to be a serve. So competing might be good, but when we're competing for my particular benefit, the, uh, my way, my style, what the I want to see happen, how I want to see happen, because I'm the king, I'm the boss, I'm the director, I got that way up here, then I compete and it turns into a zero sum orientation. I win, at the expense that you lose. Now, if I'm trying to get a bad behavior out of you for the benefit of you and the community, as we saw in the fraternal correction reading in the book of Matthew, then I have to be firm. But I'm not firm, I'm not assertive for my sake. I'm firm and I'm assertive for your sake. Make sure we do that kindly. Make sure we do that out of love, not out of anger, not out of frustration. If we go to the opposite spectrum, cooperativeness, accommodating, accommodating, uh, uh, accede to the other party, maintain harmony. And sometimes that's good. We want harmony. But all too often, I give in the benefit of the group just to accommodate, just to avoid, just that we have peace. But if we don't address the issues that are at hand that interfere in the well-being of the group, accommodating might not be a good thing. But if it's for the benefit of all, not necessarily for the benefit of me, then accommodating is a good thing. Now, as we go through this max center of the curve, on the high right side, we have collaborating. And here is what we're looking for. We're looking to work together. How do we manage a conflict? Let's collaborate. Let's look for the best solution to a problem that fits everybody's need. The word all come out winning. It expands the range of possibilities and options. It achieves a win-win outcome as opposed to win-lose or maybe lose-win. So when we collaborate, all are happy. But we have to be careful that we're not collaborating to keep the status quo when the status quo needs to change for the sake of the group for the sake 
of the mission for the sake of the direction we're headed to. So collaborating is probably the best because both parties that are in conflict get something out of it. There has to be dialogue. There has to be conversation. There has to be agreements. Not like today in politics. People are strongly competing and because they want what they want, they won't give in and the, and the politics is not taking us to a good place from the political economy. But I'm not gonna, I'm not, it happened over the last 20, 30 years. It's just, I'm not talking about this particular uh, political uh, uh, time frame. Sometimes uh, we have to compromise. And compromise, it, it, it kind of moves into minimal and acceptable, but acceptable to all. The relationships are undamaged. So sometimes we want to keep the relationship going. We want to keep that friendliness. We want to make sure that um, there's not a disruption in, 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 in the organization life. So compromising could be enforcing the status quo. And if the status quo is something we want to move away from, let's not compromise. If the status quo, it's with helping us keep together and be able to be productive, then let's compromise. Let's look for what's best for the full team. And then the other one is avoiding, which is withdrawing from the situation, maintaining neutrality. It's Avoiding feedback, and we see a little bit of that, but a little bit of that too much. Uh, no, I'm not getting involved. No, <laughs> and not me. That's their problem. No. And, and sometimes there's a moment in which you avoid a problem. And I mentioned a little bit earlier, a few minutes ago, that if it's not the right moment to give feedback to somebody because you're angry, because you're frustrated. You avoid the conflict there, but you do not eliminate the possibility. You just address the conflict when the time is right. You're not avoiding, you're postponing. But make sure that when there's something that needs to be fixed, something that needs to be addressed, address it, fix it. But remember, address it and fix it in a way that all win in a way that God's love is present, in a way that we reach that level of love and commitment to one another. We're not looking for how I want it done. We're not looking at how you want it done. We're looking for what is the right and the best way to do it. And that's, that's five conflict styles. So let's talk a little bit, a little bit more definition. The first style, again, is competing. Again, the goal is to win at all costs and assert your position. So quite often, competing is all about you. But what attitude do you have in that moment? I want to stop the sinfulness. I need to compete against the sinner. I want to change the sinner. Then I use competitiveness. In this style, it is vital that things are done as you want, even if there is a risk of going bad or breaking the relationship. We have to be careful with that. What counts is clinging to an idea and trying to get away with it especially when you're convinced that your position is the most successful and convenient for everybody. Better use it sparingly. Better use it sparingly. Again, it could help when you're convinced by the Lord, by your belief, by your values, uh, understanding that this belief and these values are based 
and the truth of Christ. If it's the best and most convenient for everyone, by all means, compete, but compete with love. Compete not to destroy, compete to convince, to change the minds, to change the hearts for their salvation. The second style again, compromising. And in compromising, we do so when we are more concerned with the problem and concerns of others than with our own interest. And as the result of the is gets comfortable, we give in. I really wanted to do it this way. But I agree, your way is better. I'll compromise. Let's be open to that possibility. But let's talk about what does your belief, what does my belief, and how does those beliefs benefit the full? If I'm convinced that your way is more feasible, is more possible, is more helpful than mine, I give in. Or you give in for the same reasons. The reason for which we give in is when maintaining the relationship between the parties is extremely important. Out of deference, appreci uh, appreciation, generosity, obedience, and avoiding further harm because the other party is intransigent. Sometimes we just have to help. That'll work. Just calm him down. Let's go with it. But there's something important. If you compromise, if you go with it for the right reasons, for the benefit of all, drop it. <laughs> drop it. Don't keep on bringing it up. Don't keep on bringing it up because that happens a lot too. If you don't drop it, it'll stay there. Then we have avoiding. The avoiding style, you can imagine it It consists of acting elusively and not facing the conflict. You're getting away. You're escaping. We act evasive when we consider that it is not the right time or place to deal with the conflict. When this happens, we postpone it make a detour or put any pretext to avoid it. Also, when we feel disadvantaged or think that we would not benefit because we run the risk of ending up giving in to something we don't want to give in. And we really don't want to. We don't want to feel uncomfortable or embarrassed or make others feel uncomfortable or embarrassed. So the strong decision sometimes is to avoid the conflict for deferment. But again, don't avoid it completely. Postpone it. Take care of it at a time when it's appropriate, when people are up to it. Collaborating. The collaborator, the person who collaborates in, in, in this way of handling conflicts, an attempt is made to find a solution that satisfies all parties involved. And that's what we're looking for, that all parties are satisfied, especially the divine party, especially God is satisfied with the decisions that we just made. Of course, we must work at it. Peace does not come by, by magic, but by active listening, by exchanging information, to know each point of view that everyone can defend. Everyone needs to express the reasoning for why do I think we need to do it this way. And it is the preferred style when both parties want 
to keep their relationship in good conditions. We want to reach a good conclusion, but we want to keep a good and healthy relationship in the process. We don't want to reach a conclusion that's beneficial for me and not necessarily beneficial for you because then we won't have a good relationship as a result. And in case where there is plenty of time to find a solution, everyone wins. If we find a solution that we talk about deeply. Actually, I remember I remember in, in, a, in a management class when we were talking about planning and conflict is, is part of the planning process. We have to decide we're going to do it this way, we're going to do it that way, we're going to go in this direction, we're going to go in that direction, we're going to state our mission as this, or we're going to state our mission as that, or we're going to state our uh, vision as this or that, this is the plan we're going to come up with. The time you save in not addressing issues in the planning process will be multiplied by far, by m many numbers in the implementation straight stage because we'll always have I told you we had to do it that way we sure that we definitely needed to say it this way it's late to do it now we should have planned it better and there will always be something that comes up if we do not reach a collaborative uh, rationale to make decisions Then we have accommodating. The accommodating style is halfway between avoiding and competing styles, but not as collaborative as the previous one. The concept could be neither for you or neither for me. We use it to arrive at an in intermediate solution in which everyone has given up a little in principle, it is not what you would have wanted, but it's an acceptable solution that may may be worth it. So, to prevent a lot of um, argument, to prevent a lot of conflict, to prevent a, a lot of ill feelings, okay, let's give in. Let's let's try it. And when we say let's try it, remember it's going to come back. It's going to come back to bite you if if it doesn't work. But when we say, okay, let's try it, the other party that wants to do it that way is also needs to be attentive to what are the results and accept it's not working, let's try it your way now. So that's the accommodating style. So we have five styles of conflict management. The creator of this model affirms that the most used style is that of collaborating followed by accommodating. The third style is competing and at a further distance, compromising and avoiding, as this is the last place. With the peculiarity that the competitive style is used more and more as we climb the organizational pyramid. But this does not surprise you. The higher the management level, the more competing, the more exerting of we're going to do it my way happens. It's just the way it is. Unless we have a kingly Christian working on it. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the company of scoffers. Rather, the law of of the Lord is his joy and on his law meditates day and night he is like a tree planted near a stream of water that yields its fruit in season its leaves never wither whatever he does prospers now I'm going to read something from from the book of Romans chapter 12 verse 9 through 21 and it says 
Let love be sincere. Hate what is evil. Hold on to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Anticipate one another in showing honor. Do not grow slack in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Endure in affliction. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the Holy Ones. Contribute to the needs of the Holy One. Exercise hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless those who not, do not curse them. Rejoice. I want to say that again. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Bless and do not curse them. They're a pain. But they can stop being a pain with a good response, with an appropriate response, with a loving response. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. There's moments to have fun. There's moments to laugh. There's moments to cry. Have the same regard for one another. Do not highly but associate with the lowly do not be do not be wise in your estimation do not repay anyone evil for evil be concerned for what is noble in the sight of all if possible on your part live at peace with all if possible on your part live Peace with all. Beloved, do not look for revenge, but leave the room for the wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. Don't look for vengeance. It's not your job. Look for correction. Look for feedback. Look for a positive, helpful fruitful agreement. Rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For if doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not conquer by evil, but conquer evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. I think that's the basis by which we need to address the conflict. That's the basis by which we need to actually talk about how we operate. And one more time, I'm just going to give you a whole different way of looking at a, a different picture. But it's the same thing. The pinch theory. We might have a pinch, which is something that bothers, that hurts me in the way we're working. Yes, we establish role clarity and we committed to it. There's stability and product, productivity and confidence. All of a sudden, there's a pinch. Somebody got out of the norm. Somebody did something different. Somebody new came into the system that didn't know the norm. Something happened in the process. There was a little change in the goal, the objectives. There's a pinch. So let's do a planned reconciliation. Let's go back and gather data, share and clarify the expectations and make decisions based on the changes that happen. And then we can either uh, end our process, but we need to have a reconciliation before that. The pinch will create a disruption. If you look down under the pinch, will create a disruption under the shared expectations. That's going to bring a certain level of ambiguity. That's going to bring anxiety, resentment, and blaming and guilt and we go into a crunch the crunch might lead us to a stalemate I'm angry I'm frustrated there might be a premature reconciliation okay how are we going to solve this how are we going to address it and that's where we go into that negotiation process and we go back to that productive productivity stability and confidence that crunch could also take us to reconciliation under duress. Okay, let's finish this process. I'm out of here as soon as we reach our goals. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. 
I'm out of here. So we'll do have a, a short term reconciliation. We'll finish the process that we're assigned to do and we'll separate. Or there might be a resentful termination. We don't want resentment. We don't want to terminate in a way that we will be frustrated by those results. So that's the conflict management process. I hope this was helpful. I hope this gave us a little bit of light. What we're going to do next is we're going to talk a little bit about, and this is going to be a shorter talk, about how groups come together. We're going to talk about the dynamics in groups, um, how the group develops, what happens, how do we avoid breaking apart before we even start the mission, before we ever start what we're assigned to do. And this, what we're going to talk about happens in most of the groups. It's just the dynamics of group development. Stay tuned. Take a break. I love you. And let's get back to rest. Remember, we're going back to better. Take care.